Just before we get started, I do want to mention another channel that I host called Mega Projects. It's all about mankind's greatest construction feats. Check it out through the link in the description below. More on that in a bit. About 50 kilometers north of Dublin, near a bend in the river Boyne, sits one of the oldest monuments in existence. A vast, earth-covered passage tomb, Newgrange is so ancient that it was already old when both Stonehenge and the pyramids were built. At the time its foundation stones were laid, advanced structures outside Mesopotamia were practically unheard of. In Egypt, in China, in mainland Europe, in the Americas, and in Australia, the first great building projects that people would one day undertake weren't even a glimmer in some local leader's eye. Yet here, on this rainy, foggy island on the edges of the Atlantic, a bunch of Irish farmers managed to get it together and build one of the greatest monuments in history. So who were these mysterious ancients, and what possessed them to transform this random Irish ridge into a center of culture? With no written records remaining, it's impossible to say for certain. And yet, there are enough clues littered around Newgrange itself to give us a tantalizing glimpse of their possible motivations. Today, Geographics, we're going to journey deep into Ireland's mystical past and uncover the secrets of its ancient masterpiece. If you were to ask someone the seriously geeky question, what's the world's greatest ancient site, there are certain names that you might expect to hear. Stonehenge, for example, or Petra. But there's one name that, unless you were talking to an Irishman, would almost certainly be missing. Newgrange. A giant tomb hidden within an earthen mound, Newgrange today sits beside the River Boyne, about equidistant between Dublin and the border of Northern Ireland. From afar it looks pleasant, but in an understated way, a man-made hill ringed by gleaming quartz. But make no mistake, Newgrange is far richer and far more complex than it first appears. The first thing you should understand is that it contains rock, and a lot of it. How much? Well, it's been estimated that some 200,000 tons of the stuff were used in construction, meaning it weighs more than the Sydney Opera House. And those rocks aren't just jagged lumps any bozo caveman could have rolled into place. They've been precisely cut, so precisely that the roof of Newgrange is completely watertight and has stayed that way for over 5,000 years, which, in a place as unrelentingly wet as Ireland, is really quite an achievement. The rocks have also been engraved, not all of them, but enough to catch your attention. Grand heavy stones with swirls and patterns etched into their surface with remarkable precision. But it's not just the level of craftsmanship that makes Newgrange so fascinating. Take its size, for example. Now, Newgrange isn't big in the sense of big for a modern world in which we have the Burj Khalifa, but it is big in the sense of a, it probably spent thousands of years as the biggest damn thing in Ireland sort of way. The pinnacle stands 11 meters above the ground. The mound itself measures 80 meters across. Were you to zip back in time, abduct a random caveman, and drop him in front of Newgrange, he'd probably freak out at the sheer awesome size of the mounds that would have almost no parallel in Neolithic Europe. Well, after it finished freaking out about being abducted by a time-traveling wizard man, at any rate. And this is still only just scratching the surface of Newgrange. There are the 97 massive curbstones surrounding the place, each weighing over a ton, a ring of quartz that makes its side seem to glow from far off. There are even two similar mounds nearby, plus the 37 ancient tombs of Bruna Boyne. But to really get a sense of how impressive Newgrange is, you need to look inside. There, past the ornate stone doorway, lies a narrow passage tunneling deep into the mound. After 19 dark and cramped meters, it opens out into a stone chamber with three recesses tucked into the walls, one of which once held human remains. Six meters above your head, giant stone slabs are held up without mortar, unmoved since the day they were laid five millennia ago. But that's not the real miracle of Newgrange. No, to see that, you'll need to come here in the bleak midwinter and wait for the solstice. Provided there's no cloud covering the sky, you'll then witness an ancient miracle. As the sun rises on December the 21st each year, the weak rays catch a perfectly placed portal carved into the stone above Newgrange's entrance. Over 17 breathless minutes, the light from that portal casts a glowing rectangle onto the floor, which slowly creeps along the passage until it suddenly floods into the chamber, filling it with light. 
In that moment, the world around you dissolves, the membrane between worlds collapses, and the morning seems filled with magic. It's a cool trick, even for an architect, to pull off today. In the world of Neolithic Europe, it must have seemed like a miracle. But who could have built something so spectacular so long ago? And what happened to them? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing you need to know about the builders of Newgrange is that they're a mystery. With no records left behind, all we can ever do is catch glimpses of them. But only being able to catch glimpses of them isn't the same as knowing nothing at all. First off, we know they were farmers. The ridges and valleys around Newgrange had been used extensively for agriculture by the time it was built. We also know that they were a wealthy civilization, at least for the era. After all, you don't spend valuable farming time building a monument if you haven't already got stuff like food surpluses sort it out. Beyond this, we can infer too that their civilization had advanced pretty far in certain respects, like stonework and astronomy, far enough to create a unique portal for celebrating the solstice. But we also know their civilization was falling behind in other aspects. Writing, for instance, had already appeared in Mesopotamia at this point in the form of cuneiform. Hieroglyphics, they were also on the verge of being invented in ancient Egypt. Yet the builders of Newgrange would never master the concept of turning sounds or words into symbols. It would be this, more than anything, that led to them being forgotten. The last thing we can infer about these prehistoric farmers is that they may, perhaps surprisingly, have had links to Iberia. Iberia is the bit of Europe that is today mostly made up of Spain and Portugal, about 900 kilometers from Ireland over open sea. While it's not impossible that some ancient Iberian dudes might have sailed all the way up to this rainy island and decided that a life of potatoes and Guinness was preferable to one of sunshine and flamenco, it certainly seems unlikely. And yes, to all of you pedants watching, we are aware the potatoes had not yet arrived in Ireland. It's what we in Britain like to call a joke. Anyway, the fact remains that passage tombs like Newgrange along with the pins made from antler that were found inside it, are normally associated with the Iberian Peninsula. So what they were doing all the way up in Ireland is something we can speculate on, but we can never answer for certain. However, there is one last extra detail we can guess about the builders of Newgrange. They were ambitious, and insanely so. Around 3300 BC, they began building the tombs and monuments today associated with Brew Nabonia. They started small, refining their techniques, restraining themselves as they figured out their basic goals. Once they got the hang of things, though, they went crazy. Within a century of the first tombs appearing, work began on Newgrange itself. It's possible the ancient Irish always knew they were working towards this. We know an older structure stood on the site of Newgrange that was demolished to make way for the current one, so it's possible this ridge already held some sort of spiritual value. Regardless, by 3200 BC, work had finally commenced. To help you understand how crazy long ago this is, just know that work wouldn't begin on Stonehenge over in England for another two centuries. And that would be the prototype version, the one you may recall from our Stonehenge video that was just 56 standing bluestones. The Mark II Stonehenge we see today wouldn't be built until roughly 700 years after Newgrange. That means that to Stonehenge's builders, Newgrange would have appeared older than Machu Picchu does to us today. To put it another way, you are far closer in time to both Christopher Columbus and pantaloons being an acceptable fashion choice than Stonehenge's construction was to Newgrange's. But while Newgrange might have been built way back in the mists of time, that doesn't mean it took forever to assemble. When its creators got going, they really got going. And look, if you're enjoying today's video about what is essentially an ancient mega project, you might enjoy my new channel called Mega Projects, and it's a channel all about mega projects. That's a lot of mega projects. It's about mankind's greatest achievements, where I take a deep look at incredible buildings, projects, and structures, and more. It's much more modern than this video, generally present day stuff, or even future fictional stuff like a Dyson Sphere can be really out there. Whether it's the world's most impressive skyscrapers, the International Space Station, or Chernobyl sarcophagus, cover it all. New videos come out a couple of times a week on mega projects, so if you think it could be for you, please do head over there and subscribe. There is a link in the description below. And let's get back to it.
Today, it's thought that the building of Newgrange involved up to 400 people and took 30 long years. With people dying younger back then, this means it likely took an entire lifetime. But given the amount of work involved, this totally makes sense. First, the builders had to find the stones. This wasn't as simple as just locating a good place to quarry and then getting to work. The structural slabs at Newgrange all show signs of weathering on their surfaces. This means that they weren't quarried, but rather they were found. Over in England, one of the theories about where Stonehenge's slabs came from suggests that they were left behind by retreating glaciers. In Newgrange's case, that's almost certainly what happened. So each of these big stones first needed to be located, which could have taken, well, God knows how long. While this was happening, others would have been spending years figuring out the precise point where the winter solstice sun would slice through the sky so they could build their stone portal. That being done, the smaller stones for building also needed to be found. These stones came from vast distances apart. There are some that were dragged up from the Wicklow Mountains some 114 kilometers to the south, some that were dragged down from County Down over 100 kilometers to the north. Others came from the Mourne Mountains almost as far away. The gravel it was quarried locally from a vast pit. If these ancient farmers had been intending to build a monument that symbolized the whole of Ireland pulling together, well, they couldn't have done a better job. The transportation of stones was likely done via boat, first sailing them along the Irish Sea, then down into the Boyne River. However, that would still have left the builders with nearly a kilometer slope that they needed to drag all the rocks up. Ropes and timber rollers would have been essential, which would have involved yet more work to make. All in all, it was a gigantic project, likely the biggest the British Isles, possibly the European continent, had yet seen. And here's the kicker. We still don't really know why they bothered. Why did these long dead guys go to all this effort? Most of the theories tend to focus on the remarkable solstice effects of the roof box. Being farmers, it could be that the Neolithic Irish linked Newgrange with the cycle of death and renewal that surrounded the winter solstice each year, the return of their crops from a dead land. On the other hand, it could have been more of a spiritual act. We know Newgrange is a passage tomb that, no matter what else it may have been used for, stored the remains of cremated bodies. It's been suggested that the sunbeam piercing the tomb each winter could have been intended as a literal path Way, one leading the spirits of the dead out of their tomb and into whatever afterlife these people believed in. Or maybe Newgrange's use was more prosaic, as with many Neolithic sites. Some have argued that the solstice alignment was more to do with creating a giant astronomical calendar. But there's another possibility too, one that's not accepted by many archaeologists, but that we should cover nonetheless. What if Newgrange isn't a prehistoric site at all? It wasn't until the mid-20th century that Newgrange finally underwent extensive restorations to become the site that we know today. Prior to that, it was little more than a giant muddy mound with an ornate entrance. You can even find old pictures online of cows grazing on top of it. Because of this, modern Newgrange has some features that are controversial today. For example, it's not entirely certain the brilliant quartz facade was meant to be a wall at all. It could be that the quartz was supposed to lie on the ground in a ring around the monument. But there's one aspect of the restoration that is very hotly contested. According to a small yet vocal group of academics, the roof box that allows the amazing solstice spectacle to happen wasn't originally there. In fact, it was only constructed 50 years ago. We really need to be clear that this isn't a mainstream view. The vast majority believe Newgrange today is substantially the same as it was thousands of years ago. On the other hand, the anti-roof box faction aren't just cranks. Their most vocal champion is Michael Gibbons, an archaeologist who used to be co-director of Ireland's Office of Public Works, National Sites and Monuments Record Office. In 2016, he co-authored a paper arguing that the roof box was created by accident during the 20th century restoration, rather rather than being an ancient feature. But his argument, it went even deeper. Rather than a Neolithic site, Gibbons contended that Newgrange should be recognized instead as a Hiberno-Roman cult site. For those of us not up to scratch on our ancient designations, Hibernia was the classical name for Ireland. While Ireland was never conquered by the Romans, they certainly popped over from Britain for visits, and we know they spent time at Newgrange because of all the crap that they left lying around. What Gibbons and others argued is that in our rush to declare Newgrange a Neolithic site, we ignored a ton of evidence that it reached its present form and got most of its use during the Roman era. 
Since we're YouTubers rather than trained archaeologists, we're not going to make a judgment call on this one. All we're going to do is inform you that this theory exists, that it's not mainstream, and that you can read more about it yourself if you so wish. And with that, let's get back to our main narrative. Although Newgrange was finished all the way back in 3200 BC, that wasn't the end of the work. Over the next few hundred years, the Bruna Borgna site was gradually added to, until it was a vast place of likely deep spiritual importance. Unfortunately for those who'd built it, it wouldn't be theirs for much longer. Around 2500 BC, the Beaker folk, still our favorite historical civilization named after a Muppets character, <laughs> arrived in the British Isles. Known for their distinctive pottery beaker cups, they quickly overran both Great Britain and Ireland. Modern genetic testing shows that they almost completely replaced the native populations in just a few hundred years. But replacing the natives isn't the same as totally destroying their culture. Not long after their arrival, around 2200 BC, the beaker folk began incorporating Newgrange into their own rituals. A huge enclosure of wooden posts was built around the monument in which the cremated remains of animals were buried. Just a couple of centuries later, the wooden posts would in turn be replaced by a stone circle. Beyond this, though, construction simply stopped. For whatever reason, the Beaker Stone Circle was the last addition ever made to Newgrange. Although the site itself would be visited by both the Iron Age Celts and the Romans, its era of growth was over. Now all that remained was for Newgrange to be forgotten. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when Newgrange vanished from Ireland's consciousness. Some have suggested it was already a relic by the Iron Age, although evidence seems to show that the Celts visited it. Others have pinpointed the Roman era on the British Isles as Newgrange's endpoint. Though, as we've seen, Roman relics uncovered suggest that the place still held some importance for them. That leaves just one other major shift in Irish history when Newgrange could have been forgotten. The arrival of Christianity. It was around the 5th century AD that Christianity finally reached this remote corner of Europe. By then, Newgrange hadn't been added to for over 2,000 years. In our own time, the Colosseum in Rome has had facelifts more recent than that. So it seems likely that Newgrange was already little more than a curiosity, a remnant of some long-dead civilization. But Christianity, with its prohibitions against pagan sites, seems to have pushed it over the edge. Quite how things unfolded, we're not exactly sure. All we know is that it was likely around this time that Newgrange was totally abandoned. And then, as time passed and the years rolled on, it was eventually forgotten about altogether. Still, some trace of cultural memory did survive, even if it was only in the form of knowing about a mound that was full of stones. Over the centuries, the odd builder would come by and dig some of that stone out every now and then, though thankfully never enough to compromise the site. Eventually, the monument wound up inside the lands of Mellifont Abbey. It's here that the name Newgrange comes from, Grange being a word for farm. As for the new part, well, it's kind of like how New York or New England still retain the words in their names, despite being centuries old. At some point, the area was part of the Abbey's new Grange or farm, and the name just stuck. Even after the Abbey closed in 1539, the mounds continued to be known as Newgrange. That its true nature was ever rediscovered is thanks almost entirely to one notorious battle. In 1688, a complex series of events saw the Catholic King of Britain, James II, deposed and replaced by a Dutch Protestant known as William of Orange. Although William's takeover of England and Wales was so bloodless it became known as the Glorious Revolution, in Ireland it was a rather different matter. Their local Catholics rallied to the former king's cause. The result was William invading Ireland. His troops and James's finally met on July 1, 1690. Their epic smackdown would become known as the Battle of the Boyne. Today, the battle remains a cultural flashpoint, especially in Northern Ireland. But for our purposes, it's what came next that's really important. In the aftermath of the Protestant victory, William doled out land to all of his supporters. Among them was Charles Campbell, who has gifted the lands that Newgrange stood on. Nine years later, Campbell was in need of stone for his estate and told his laborers to go and find some. It was this improbable chain of events that would lead to the rediscovery of Newgrange. In 1699, the Welsh antiquary Edward Lloyd just happened to be visiting Ireland. 
A friend of Sir Isaac Newton, Lloyd was a keen scholar with a remarkable eye for detail. He was also hugely passionate about anything ancient. So when word reached him that some laborers on the estate of one Charles Campbell had accidentally discovered a secret cave while digging up rocks, he rushed to investigate. That cave, of course, was none other than the entrance to Newgrange, and Lloyd was able to get there in time to see most of the excavations and make detailed notes. It was from the four letters he wrote that we get our earliest scholarly description of Newgrange. Nowadays, Lloyd's letters are useful as a reference point when doing work on Newgrange and tracing its architectural history. But in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, they were also extremely useful for building interest. It was thanks to Lloyd's work that Sir Thomas Molyneux came to Campbell's estate to visit Newgrange. When Molyneux published his own book in 1726, it in turn enticed even more scholars to Ireland. Over the next century and a half, roughly 200 antiquarians visited Newgrange. Some were serious scholars there to learn, while others were basically crackpots there to stoke their own wacko theories. And some of these theories were seriously wacko. Since most of these history-loving dudes came from non-Irish backgrounds, most of them were convinced the ancient Irish could never have built such a structure. Instead, they twisted themselves in knots, proving that its real builders were the Vikings or even the Egyptians, presumably while taking a short break from building the pyramids. Still, this flood of interest did have one positive effect. By 1882, Newgrange was well known enough that it was included in the British Ancient Monuments Protection Act. Since Ireland was part of the United Kingdom back then, that meant conservation efforts finally began. Even so, it would take many, many decades for Newgrange to be properly excavated. It wasn't until 1962 that archaeologist Michael J. O. Kelly started restoration work at the site. In the end, it took 11 years for O'Kelly to return it to its original glory. The new Grange you see in modern photos? It didn't look like that until 1973. Today, Newgrange is on UNESCO's World Heritage List and regarded as one of the greatest, best-preserved Neolithic sites in Europe. And yet, for some strange reason, it remains relatively unknown. Take visitor numbers. In the last couple of years, Newgrange has recorded up to 200,000 visitors annually. Stonehenge, on the other hand, has recorded between 850,000 and nearly 1.5 million. Then there's wider awareness. While Stonehenge, Machu Picchu, the Pyramids, Petra, and a whole slew of other prehistoric sites are instantly recognizable, knowledge of Newgrange remains mostly confined to people who either have a connection to Ireland or are massive history nerds like us. And this is a real shame. As we've seen today, Newgrange is a masterpiece of ancient architecture, a monument that, at the time it was built, was unrivaled perhaps anywhere on Earth. In short, it deserves to be more widely known, its significance to our history more frequently celebrated. Because it was here, in this wet corner of this one rainy island, that a bunch of long-forgotten farmers decided to do something that had never been done before, to build a monument that would last for centuries. With today's video, we hope we've shown that, against the odds, they succeeded. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, do check out that new channel I mentioned called Mega Projects. I'm linking to it below. And thank you for watching.